the vertebral artery runs upwards through the transverse processes of the upper six cervical vertebrae. Here's the vertebral artery. The two vertebral arteries pass through these openings in each vertebra. After passing through the transverse process of the atlas, the artery turns backwards and then medially to pass through the occipital membrane and the dura just below the foramen magnum, which is here. To follow the vertebral artery, we'll divide the cranium along this line and remove the brain. Here are the two vertebral arteries passing through the dura. The vertebral arteries join together, forming this large artery, the basilar artery, which runs upwards and forwards above and behind the basilar part of the occipital bone. The vertebral arteries entering down here and joining to form the basilar artery. Now, we'll complete the picture. To name the vessels we're looking at, we'll start with the main branches of the internal carotid. The internal carotid gives off the anterior cerebral and posterior communicating arteries, then continues with a different name. From here, the vessel is called the middle cerebral artery. The two anterior cerebral arteries curve towards each other above the chiasm, then pass upwards and forwards, close together, to enter the longitudinal cerebral fissure between the two cerebral hemispheres. Just above the optic chiasm, the two anterior cerebral arteries are connected to each other by this very short anterior communicating artery, which is part of the arterial circle. The middle cerebral artery, which is the direct continuation of the internal carotid, curves laterally. It enters the lateral cerebral fissure between the frontal and temporal lobes. We'll follow it there shortly. The pale areas on this artery are patches of atheroma. Now we'll go around to a view from behind to see the vertebral and basilar arteries and the vessels that arise from them. Here are the two vertebral arteries joining together to form the basilar artery. Down here, four inferior cerebellar arteries usually arise, two posterior and two anterior. These are the posterior ones. In this specimen, the anterior ones are represented by this one vessel. In addition, the basilar artery gives off small branches to the pons and this labyrinthine artery that supplies the inner ear. Four branches arise from the top of the basilar artery, these two superior cerebellar arteries, and the two terminal branches of the basilar, the posterior cerebral arteries. The posterior cerebral artery curves backwards and laterally above this nerve, the ocular motor. It curls around the cerebral peduncle. We'll look at its course in a few minutes. Just as it turns, the posterior cerebral artery is joined by this small artery that we've seen already, the posterior communicating artery. Its component parts from front to back are the anterior communicating artery, the anterior cerebral arteries, the internal carotids, the posterior communicating arteries, and the posterior cerebral arteries. The arrangement is often somewhat asymmetrical. Here, the left posterior communicating artery is very small. The arteries have been filled with red latex. Over this area, the arachnoid layer and the many small vessels in it have been removed so that we can see the major arteries. Here's the optic chiasm. Here beneath it are the divided ends of the internal carotid arteries. Here's the anterior cerebral artery passing around the optic chiasm, which will pull downwards. Here's the anterior communicating artery. The two anterior cerebral arteries turn upwards to enter the longitudinal cerebral fissure. We'll follow them shortly. The internal carotid 
which we'll go back to, gives off the posterior communicating artery, then continues to become the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery enters the lateral cerebral fissure between the frontal and temporal lobes of the cerebral hemisphere. Coming from below, here are the two vertebral arteries joining to form the basilar artery, which is quite off-center in this specimen. Here are three of the possible four inferior cerebellar arteries. Here are the two superior cerebellar arteries. Here's the division of the basilar into the two posterior cerebral arteries. To follow the course of the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries, we'll divide the brain in the midline and look at just one cerebral hemisphere. Each anterior cerebral artery runs upwards and then backwards, close to the corpus callosum. It gives off branches which supply this area on the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere and which then reach over the superior margin of the hemisphere to supply this area on the lateral aspect. Next, we'll follow the middle cerebral artery. Here it is again, running in the depths of the lateral cerebral fissure. The middle cerebral artery gives off branches which emerge along the length of the lateral cerebral fissure to supply this area on the lateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere. Lastly, we'll follow the posterior cerebral artery. It runs laterally, just above this nerve, the ocular motor, then runs backward, passing around the cerebral peduncle. To follow it, we'll again look at the cerebral hemisphere by itself. Here's the posterior cerebral artery. It winds around between the cerebral peduncle, which has been divided here, and the most medial part of the temporal lobe. The posterior cerebral artery gives off branches which supply this area on the medial aspect and underside of the hemisphere, and this aspect on the lateral aspect. The brain is richly covered with veins. Over the surface of the cerebral hemispheres, the veins emerge from the sulci, join with one another, and run upwards within the arachnoid layer. Here, behind the midbrain, veins converge from many directions to form this great cerebral vein. We'll see where that goes shortly. The falx and the tentorium. In this specimen, there are some openings in the falx, which is not unusual. The two sagittal sinuses run the length of the falx. The smaller inferior sagittal sinus runs within its free border. The larger superior sagittal sinus runs within its attached border. Blood in both the sagittal sinus flows from front to back. Here, we've removed one side of the superior sagittal sinus so that we can look into it. As we saw in a previous section, the superior sagittal sinus is contained in a triangular space that's enclosed on all three sides by dura. At several places, side passages called lacunae open into the sinus. Veins from the surface of the brain open into the lacunae. The superior sagittal sinus ends where the attachments of the falx and the tentorium meet. Also running toward the same point is the straight sinus, which will lay open. The straight sinus runs along the junction between the falx and the tentorium. At its upper end, it receives the inferior sagittal sinus and also the great cerebral vein. Here, there's a major joining and branching of sinuses, called the confluence of sinuses. We'll look at it in a different dissection, of just the back of the head. The confluence of the sinuses is here. To see it, we'll remove the falx and the tentorium, leaving just their lines of attachment. Here's the confluence laid open. Leading from it on each side are the two major outflow channels for venous blood, the transverse sinuses. Each transverse sinus 
runs within the attached border of the tentorium. Starting here in the midline, the transverse sinus follows the attachment of the tentorium round to here, then continues by turning sharply downwards in this S-shaped groove just behind the clitoris temporal bone. The sinus goes by two different names. This part is the transverse sinus. This part is the sigmoid sinus. To follow the sigmoid sinus, we'll look at a different skull. Here's the groove for the right sigmoid sinus. Here's the groove for the left one. They're usually unequal in size. The sigmoid sinus leaves the cranial cavity by passing through this irregular opening, the jugular foramen, along with three cranial nerves that we saw in the previous section. Here, we're looking into the posterior cranial fossa from behind. The cerebellum has been removed. We'll remove the dura that covers the sigmoid sinus. Within the jugular foramen, the end of the sigmoid sinus turns sharply downwards, becoming continuous with the internal jugular vein. This central strip of dura contains the superior sagittal sinus. We'll remove the dura that forms the roof of the sinus. These small projections in the floor of the sinus and on its sides are arachnoid granulations. They're upward protrusions of the arachnoid membrane. At their surface, cerebrospinal fluid from the subarachnoid space is transferred back into the bloodstream. The cavernous sinus is the space around the artery. It extends forward to the superior orbital fissure and backwards almost to the dorsum celli. It's bounded medially by the dura that lines the pituitary fossa. As we've seen, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus contains these three cranial nerves, the third, fourth, and sixth. Outside these lies the trigeminal ganglion, and outside that, the dura of the middle cranial fossa. To get a cross-sectional view of the cavernous sinus, we'll go to a different specimen and divide it in the frontal plane along this line. This is the cavernous sinus. The big cavity in the midline is a sinus of a different order. It's the sphenoid sinus. Here's the divided internal carotid artery passing forwards. Here are cranial nerves three, four, and six. Here's the trigeminal ganglion. Here's the dura. Here's the pituitary gland, contained within the dura that creates the pituitary fossa. The two cavernous sinuses are connected to each other behind the pituitary gland. The cavernous sinus receives blood from several sources, including the superior orbital vein, a major vein from the orbit that connects the cavernous sinus to veins in the upper part of the face. The cavernous sinus drains into the two petrosal sinuses, superior and inferior, which have been exposed on the right side. The petrosal sinuses also receive veins from the cerebellum. They empty into the sigmoid sinus up here and under here.